Thank you everyone for joining us at this, our second Q&A session for First Nations consumers, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people living across Queensland. Uh, my name's Melissa Fox, I'm CEO of False Consumers Queensland, and I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of all the lands on which we're gathered and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I'm here on the land of the Yuggera and the Turrbal people, and I would like to acknowledge that no treaty was ever signed and this sovereignty was never ceded on these lands. Um, so I'll be facilitating this morning's session with the wonderful Linda Maybanks, also working with Health Consumers Queensland. Welcome, Linda. Um, and I'll uh, briefly hand over to Linda now. Good morning, everybody. I'd also like to acknowledge um, the traditional owners of the lands in which we're all gathered today, um, pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'm a proud younger woman and I have the blessing to work and live on country um, out here in Ipswich. Um, I'm working with Health Consumers Queensland on a project called Amplifying Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Voices. And this Q&A session is one of many engagement activities that we're doing with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health consumers across the state, um, trying to develop um, some um, sort of framework to help um, health services better engage with our mob um, across the state. I'm working on this project until 30th of June, and then we're hoping to, um, yeah, provide our findings out to the state um, and hopefully help some of our health services have those um, support mechanisms in place to engage our mob better um, and have them involved in projects and health service delivery. So, yeah, thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, and this Everything that is talked about today will definitely go towards um, some of the findings that we have as part of this project. Thanks, Linda. And um, we're so enjoying working with you and so excited to see what comes out of this project. Um, so I do have apologies to pass on from Hayleen Grogan, the Chief Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, Health Officer and the Deputy Director General of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Division within Queensland Health. Um, some of you may um, have seen um, the latest in the news this morning. Um, we will have an update um, uh, from Gregory within the department um, on that situation, but unfortunately um, uh, supporting the response means that Hayleen is unable to join us and um, she sends um, her huge Apologies and wishes that she could be with all of us this morning. Um, so I would like to welcome um, Gregory Richardson um, from her division from the department to introduce himself and um, to give an acknowledgement of country. Okay, just off mute. Um, thanks, Melissa. Um, just like to start with um, acknowledgement of. Um, country um, and pay my respect to elders past, future and present. And also I'm sitting in Brisbane office um, on the lands of Turbal and Jaguar people. Um, I think as um, Melissa outlined, Hayleen's an apology because of the um, emerging number of cases, um, community cases. So I'll just start with a very brief rundown, but we will look to send out some further information to the forum and to members as it becomes available. Um, overnight, there was four new community cases um, in addition to the previous two. Um, two have been linked to those um, cases and two are under investigation, but with a likely link um, to a nurse who works at the PA hospital. Um, so in effect, this is the uh, very contagious UK strain. So um, the Premier and Jeanette Young have um, Brisbane, Greater Brisbane area will go into lockdown from 5 p.m. tonight. So though that's the council areas of Brisbane, Ipswich, Logan, Moreton Bay and Redlands. Um, in effect, um, schools will be closed from tomorrow. Um, people will only be able to leave their home for grocery shopping, exercise, work and medical care. Um, There'll also be mask wearing and also, um, I've yet to double confirm this, but one of the um, patients had traveled to Gladstone recently. So there will be um, possible mask wearing impacts across Queensland and also staff who have been in the greater Brisbane area since 20th of March um, 
have been asked to sort of isolate and that if they're outside that region as well. Um, so that's impacting on a couple of our staff who are traveling. So we've been reaching out to them this morning. Um, I think this just highlights the um, COVID, we have to be, you know, quite flexible and responsive. Um, but the end game and what we really want to concentrate is um, getting high vaccination levels in community. So we're a bit more at less at risk of these sort of, you know, pop up outbreaks. Um, and there's some immunity and resistance in the community. So I think while this is a sort of hot issue, I think we're very keen to use this session to understand people's thoughts on vaccinations and the rollout. Um, I'll leave it there, Melissa, but happy to take any questions as it goes through. That's great. Thanks so much, Greg. And um, I apologise as well. I will need to duck out um, for a meeting with the Chief Health Officer and the DG and Haleen and others at 10am, but I hope to be back by 10.30. Um, but I'll leave you in the capable hands of Joe and Linda um, for that small period of time. Um, so uh, Health Consumers Queensland, along with the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Division um, from Queensland Health, have set up today's Q&A session um, to hear from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander consumers uh, across Queensland. As users of the health system, wherever you get your care, uh, whether that's from a local community control clinic, a GP and or a hospital, um, we know that you want to know more about the vaccine so that you can make the decision that's right for you. Um, this is the second round of Q&As that we've held for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So you can ask your questions around the COVID-19 vaccine to people in the know. Um, earlier this month, we had about 100 people join us online um, for our first Q&A session, despite the crazy weather that night, uh, lots of storms across South East Queensland, um, to ask your questions of Queensland's um, uh, Chief Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Officer, Haleen Grogan, and um, Dr Jeanette Young, our Chief Health Officer. Um, we do have a summary of that session, which we'll pop the link of if you haven't received it already uh, in the chat so you can read um, that information. Uh, so today we have an amazing panel of export, experts to join you today um, to answer your questions. And um, I'll ask each of the panel members now to do a short introduction um, so that you know who they are, um, where they're from and what they do, what they're here to share their expertise in. Um, so Greg, I will start with you first. Could you explain your role and what you do in Hailing's Division? Um, so I'm one of the directors in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Branch, oh, sorry, Division. I'm in the engagement branch, but I'm currently I've got responsibility for the First Nations COVID response. Um, I'm sort of backfilling Di Mora, who's on some well-earned leave. Um, so I think we're sort of while well keeping an eye on COVID and, you know, the importance of if you're feeling unwell, social distancing, trying to look at vaccination, comms, rollout, things like that. So that's my current job. That's great. Thanks, Greg. And thanks for joining us at such short notice. And um, it is really exciting to note that as far as I understand, Queensland is the only state um, to have uh, its own division for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health and certainly um, having someone at the DDG level um, in Haleen's role. So it's really exciting times. Uh, so I'll hand over now to Dr. Mark Wenatong. Mark. Um, hi, my name's um, Mark and um, GP in um, North Queensland, Cape York. And um, kind of work in public health and um, clinical and research and stuff like that. And um, um, and also sit with um, James on the one of the national COVID committees as well. Um, that's kind of it for me. But I, one of the things I do have though is a long background in labs. So I um, um, worked in laboratories in virology, bacteriology and stuff like that and did a bit of study at Centre for Disease Control in Atlanta um, as well. So it's kind of stuff I like um, talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Great, it's so wonderful to have you here. Thanks, Mark. Uh, and Professor James Ward. Uh, thanks, Melissa. Yep, uh, Professor James Ward at the University of Queensland. I'm a researcher, epidemiologist, and um, have been involved in the national response for COVID um, on two different or three different levels. One is the uh, Communicable Disease Network of Australia, which has really driven policy throughout the whole response uh, at the national level for the whole population. Uh, one on the Aboriginal Task Force, which Mark and I both sit on, and so does I, Haleen, actually. And, um, and thirdly, on the Atagi Vaccine Prioritisation Group to make sure that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were one of the first groups to um, 
uh, to be prioritised behind uh, behind uh, border workers and uh, frontline healthcare workers. So yeah, uh, been intimately involved in the response, but looking forward to the conversation today. Amazing, thanks, James. Uh, and um, Associate Professor Margie Datchin. Thanks very much, Melissa. Hi everyone, thanks for the invitation to be here today. I'm a paediatrician in Melbourne um, at the Royal Children's Hospital um, and a researcher at Myrtle Children's Research Institute. Um, and the main focus of our group's research is to really understand how people think and feel about vaccination and to make good choices that are right for them about vaccines across the lifespan. Um, and I've also, similar to, to James and others, been working very closely in the COVID response, um, both uh, on the third working ATAGI COVID working group around vaccine safety, confidence and evaluation, and working closely with the Victorian government. But also I sit in clinic every week and speak with parents who have concerns about vaccines. And so I'm very keen to hear people's questions and see if I can uh, provide some answers around the COVID vaccines. So thanks. Wonderful. Thanks, Margie. How lucky are we? Um, and how lucky are they to be able to hear from you today? Um, so I'd like to round out my welcomes to thank all of you um, who have joined us today, um, your precious time. Uh, and we're really looking forward to diving into hearing your questions and comments. Um, quickly, and I'm really sorry, I will just jump into some housekeeping. Um, and also, um, before I do that, acknowledge the people on um, the line from our teams who have been um, working tirelessly over the last few weeks and pivoting like ballerinas this morning with the changes. Um, my team, Suzanne, Joe, Alison, and also Rima's online listening, and also um, Liz from the division. Thank you all so much for making today possible. Uh, so, some housekeeping. Um, as you will have seen by the little message popping up, we are recording this session today um, and we will make it publicly available for those who are unable to attend. Uh, please uh, bear this in mind if you would like to ask a question. Um, you can keep your camera off if you would prefer, um, but we would love to take a photograph. Um, so if you are happy to keep your camera on, um, we will do that just before we jump into the Q&As. Uh, so as I said before, please introduce yourselves in, in the chat if you are able to. Um, and if you're watching as a group, please let us know. Uh, also rename yourself if necessary. I can't see it happening today, but sometimes you can see, you know, Samsung, Samsung 33 and we don't know who you are. Um, so um, please, if you feel comfortable, um, rename yourself. Uh, please pop any assist, uh, requests for technical assistance in the chat. Um, Joe and Suzanne will jump on and give you a hand if you need um, um, help with anything today. And um, they will also be um, grabbing your questions and your comments from the chat and putting them into uh, the document um, that I'm using and that Joe and Linda will use um, to ask your questions of the panel. And we find that a really rich source of information to be able to feed into our um, briefing papers that we write after all of our sessions. So we document the questions that you're asking and the things that are important to you and then send them out um, through key decision makers um, across the Queensland health system. Uh, and to keep the forum manageable, we'll be keeping all microphones on mute, if that's okay, uh, until we may ask you to ask your question of the panel, and then you can take yourselves off mute. Um, so apparently we don't have to take a photo. Suzanne took some photos. I hope we were all posing um, nicely. Yes, excellent, good, great. Um, so uh, uh, please let us know if your camera was on and you would have preferred not to have been in a photo. We can take another one um, at some point. You can message Suzanne um, via private message. So without further ado, I think we can move straight into um, questions. Uh, final comment is just, and um, we expect this will happen, uh, that everyone um, will be respectful, especially of differing views, respectful of each other, respectful of um, uh, our panel members, and we look forward to a really rich conversation. So um, I'll hand over now to um, Greg uh, to give us a brief overview on the vaccine rollout. Greg. Thanks, Melissa. Um, now, the vaccine rollout is, um, we're doing it in national partnership with the Commonwealth and the other states and jurisdictions. Um, obviously, the initial priority has been the people in 1A, which is um, the border force workers, people in quarantines, the direct clinical staff who are 
probably more at risk of um, coming in contact with COVID patients. Um, then we are with the rollout to the general practice and more um, available vaccines. We've now, um, while we still have some 1A clients to do, um, which are principally the responsibility of um, Queensland Health, I'm noting the Commonwealth will do um, aged care residents and disability residents um, and also the associated staff. Um, we're now looking at 1B, um, which includes Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people over 55. Um, and it's also, we um, have agreement from the Commonwealth that in areas in basically rural and remote, um, to, you know, if a uh, town's under 5,000, there'll be a more community-based approach for adults over 18 rather than sort of segregating 1A, 1B, 2, things like that. Um, so obviously it takes a little bit of logistics to bring that together. Um, if I have to be a little bit honest, I think um, everyone may be aware that, you know, Italy sort of held up some, you know, vaccine deliveries and that. So I think um, the TGA has approved the, um, from CSL, the locally developed AstraZeneca, um, they've agreed, um, cleared the batch. So I think post Easter, that will be the um, vaccine that will probably be in most supply and allow a bit more consistency and bringing on more sites. Um, I would definitely encourage people to look at the Commonwealth site, particularly um, going through the GPs and AMSs, um, but do note that they're coming in in phased approaches as well. Um, I think for us, um, particularly for First Nations people, we've absolutely prioritised the Torres Strait because the increased risk from PNG. So they have done the northernmost islands um, and we're achieving rates of 75% of adults um, being first dose vaccination. Um, and that will, you know, go from the northern islands, Sabai, Badu, Durham, um, and then go down to Torres Strait, um, sorry, Thursday Island and the surrounding and then to NPA. So we're doing a very community-based Queensland health driven approach in um, the Torres, which will then go down to Cape York as our immediate priority. Um, so it's been quite well received and we've done, you know, board of four staff and Q build staff and others taking a very opportunistic community-based approach. Um, so was there any, does anyone have any particular questions that I may be able to answer? I'm sure they'll pop up as we go through the morning, Greg, but thank you. Thanks for that overview. And I believe there is also um, a link to some information online for First Nations consumers. Perhaps, um, Liz, if while we're asking um, questions and going through the Q&A today, you might be able to pop that in the chat for participants. That would be great. Um, all right, now I can see one question here so far um, and I'll hand over to Simon and Elviana to ask their question. Thank you for sharing that information, Greg. I'm a descendant from the Torres Straits. I come from Eru and uh, Murray Island and I've got a lot of elders in the Torres Straits, including some of my parents, they're still up there. So I was kind of a bit concerned about the rollout of the vaccine up there because I know like some of my elders uh, have got chronic diseases. So I'm hoping that everything is going to go okay up there with them. Like I can appreciate where you're coming from in regards to Queensland Health and stuff like that, but I'm still not quite sure about the use of the vaccine. I'm also a traditional healer. And I was also wondering whether traditional healers have been consulted in this whole process with the vaccine rollout, even before the vaccine rollout. <clears throat> Thanks for that question. Um, questions. I think um, to reiterate, while we've been, um, the vaccine isn't mandatory uh, for either staff or public. Um, what they've been doing in the islands um, have been sort of doing community-based information sessions. Mm -hmm. um, previously, we've been doing a bit of work trying to 
Um, we've engaged with the mayors, the local health workers and communities and that. And we've also been training a number of health workers um, in both delivery of vaccine, but a broader understanding so they can um, look to be sort of the people um, talking to community. Um, mm -hmm. for, I think for um, chronic disease, um, we're absolutely sort of suggesting that um, people do get vaccinated. Um, yes. With the Taurus, as I said, we're probably taking more of community adults over 18. Um, your question around the um, traditional healers, um, to be honest, um, to my knowledge, that has not been considered that I'm aware of. Um, okay, um, because we also have medicines that should be considered in the process of trying to deal with these issues. We have medicines that, that will help the lung be strong, strong enough to deal with the exposure to these vaccine, uh, to these, um, to the uh, virus, sorry, you know. The other thing I wanted to know was, is the border shut between New Guinea and Torres Straits? Yeah, so... Um, Sorry, Greg, Greg, do you mind if I just jump in there? I'd love to um, hand over to James, Mark yep. or Margie um, for that first question. Is that okay? And then we'll come back to the border question. Um, so James, Mark, Margie, would you like to respond to the issue around traditional healers and the rollout of the vaccine, particularly in the Torres? Okay. Yeah, I'll go first. Uh, thanks, Margie. Um, so the first thing I think to remember is that the vaccine has been rolled out to half a billion people globally. Um, the vaccine trials were very quick, but they did include around 30,000 Indigenous peoples from around the world. And we know um, there were no differences in immune response for Indigenous peoples globally uh, to the vaccine to non-Indigenous populations. We also know that um, a significant proportion of the clinical trials involved people with chronic conditions and the immune response was very similar to people without chronic conditions. So it's very effective in that way. Um, and we know that the Taurus rollout has been um, very effective in the last week. And I'm not sure if Greg's got the data um, at hand or is able to say it, but there's been a very good uptake of uh, vaccine in the Taurus, which has been obviously um, of great concern with us, given the PNGs on the border uh, with the Taurus. Um, the idea about um, traditional healers in the rollout of the vaccine, as with all traditional healers, um, uh, they should be considered as complementary to Western medicine. And I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, I'm not sure if the, um, if traditional um, medicine has been proven against the COVID virus, um, SARS-CoV-2, um, as yet, but it, um, certainly a question that uh, should be worthy of investigation. But um, what we do know is that the vaccine is very effective at reducing um, severity of disease for everybody in the population, and we are aiming to get a high coverage um, for the Australian population as we move forward. Thanks, James. Mark, do you have anything to add? You just unmute, Mark. <laughs> Big musician, I eh? can't even turn. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> um, um, look, I, I, um, I'd, I'd really like to take on board the stuff around the traditional healers. Um, we've done a lot of community consultation and interviewing of local community members throughout the Cape um, through a point of the community controlled mob up there. Um, I, I, couldn't speak for the Taurus, although we've done like resource information for up there and with Paula's mob up there, the problem healthcare mob as well. But um, um, currently there's been no, as far as I know from our kind of community controlled organisations anyway, no really specific um, reaching out to our traditional healers around this. And, and I, I think it's a really important thing. Um, and I think once again, um, if um, our traditional healers got, got a good grasp of this, um, they could be a biggest advocate and, and biggest support in this as well as um adding adding those additional um traditional medicines that um that they know may be helpful um so um i think it's a really good um i mean i've, I've taken on board <clears throat> well there are two forms of traditional healing one is the use of energies and the other is using the bush medicines mm. you know <clears throat> So if you're not familiar with the use of energies, you're not going to understand how effective it is against preventing 
mm. you know, the, the community from being exposed mm. to the virus, you know? If their energy is in their body are low, they're going to be more susceptible to the virus. Margie, I'll hand over to you and um, then I will have to dash and hand over to Joe and Linda. Anything you would add? Yeah, thanks, Melissa. Elviana, I think that's an excellent point and I think we would all agree that engaging the traditional healers is essential and that we need to all be working together. And as James said, that we need to recognise that the vaccines are only part of the weapons we have against COVID. Um, they work extremely well um, and they are safe and we can give you lots of information around that both from the trials and from the real world data that we have now, mm -hmm. um, both in the UK and Scotland and in the US and elsewhere. Um, but we still need to use all the other means we have to protect people against the virus. And that includes the masks and all the social distancing measures and the traditional medicines, the energy that you're talking about and the bush medicines. We all need to work together. So I think what I would say is it's critical that if traditional healers have questions or worries that they ask them and that we work together, really. Thanks, well, I'd, I'd rather that occur. You know, I also am I'm highly trained in Western medicine, in the Western medicine system. I'm a public health doctor and I'm also a registered nurse and I've worked clinically in the Western system. So I can understand where you're coming from. But the gap is always the, the voice of the traditional healer. Yeah. No, I think it's an excellent <clears throat> point. And I think, you know, everyone here on this, um, in this meeting would be in agreement with you that we need to work together and that we need to make sure that we are sort of united and answering each other's questions. Exactly, because at the moment, what I'm doing is if my parents have got the uh, COVID vaccine, I'm cleaning, I'm using energy to clean. And, and for me, that's a, a prevention for what could occur. Yeah. You know, so I'm using both Western knowledge and traditional knowledge. Fantastic. You know. Yeah. But unfortunately, I can't do that for everybody else, if you understand why, because I'm not sitting in that area where I can do that, you know. And there are a lot of other healers yeah. within Queensland that have got the capacity to assist, you know? But the gap right. is your the Western, Western practitioners do not really understand what we actually do do. You know, that's one of the gaps, you know? Yeah. Greg, could I hand over to you to respond to how perhaps particularly Queensland Health um, could link in with that network of traditional healers mm -hmm. and also respond to the question around the closure of the PNG border and that possibility? Yeah, I think... Um... I think we could bring it up because we're on a national working group with the Commonwealth around the rollout of vaccine for First Nations. So um, we have a weekly meeting. So um, we can look to bring that up there. Um, and um, maybe I can share some, Mel, Melissa, if you just want to do some sharing of emails, happy to talk further. Um, I think the PNG border, um, the treaty has been suspended since the mm -hmm. outbreak of um, COVID um, since March 2020. Um, Border Force um, have stepped up their capacity in the last two weeks. Um, they've got additional staff on the island and additional boats and radar and that. Um, there has been some incursions, but as yet um, no incursions um, to have been tested positive for COVID. But mm -hmm. obviously we are also hoping that the um, the vaccine rollout, um, I think, increases in PNG, um, but definitely um, we've also got point-of-care testing machines up on the Northern Islands and TI, so uh, for anyone who does present, um, and, you know, people do need medical treatment and things like that, they do get tested as um, when they first arrive on the island mm -hmm. um, and procedures are followed. So. I think at this point, um, with good planning and good sort of cross-governmental support, um, there hasn't been a um, PNG sort of incident with um, Torres Strait as yet. But it's, you know, it's wait and see and we've got to keep vigilant. Yeah, put protection up around the borders. <laughs> yep. Thanks, Eliana <laughs> and Greg, for responding yeah, to that. thank you all. <clears throat> Melissa. Um, Sorry, Joe. I have just found out um, uh, that my meeting has been postponed till ten thirty. So um, I can stick around for another half an hour. So sorry. Thank you, um, Elviana. Did you have any further questions? 
No, that's it for now. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so Enid, we'd love to hear from you about your question and travel. You're still on mute, Enid, if you are asking your question. I'll give you a couple more seconds and then I'll read it out. And then I can see, Margie, thank you. You have responded in the chat as well. So I might hand over um, to you to respond to Enid's question. Margie? Oh, sure. Sorry, I thought Enid might uh, pipe up, so maybe she might want to after I've um, made a couple of comments. But thanks for that question, Enid. Um, the vaccines have been very well tolerated by people with chronic illness. And of course, it's been very important that they've been included in the clinical trials because we know that those people are one of the groups at highest risk from getting very sick from COVID. And what we mean by that is obviously getting admitted to hospital or even potentially dying. So it's actually really important that we prioritize people with chronic medical conditions to get the vaccines. These vaccines are not live vaccines. They are inactivated vaccines. Um, so they are well tolerated by people with immunocompromising conditions or anyone with an immune system that's not working as well as it might for whatever reason. But many of the chronic um, conditions such as diabetes, high blood pressure, chronic kidney disease, those are the people that are at higher risk of getting really sick from COVID. So I actually think we need to recommend that they, that, that they do come forward early and get their vaccine and they shouldn't wait. Um, we are in a fortunate position in Australia that we have been able to observe, um, you know, uh, over 300 million cases now of, of COVID vaccine given globally. Um, and there are not any vaccine safety signals in people with chronic conditions. Um, so I would really encourage people not to wait. And in terms of a penalty, there's no penalty if people don't get the vaccine. These vaccines are not mandatory. Uh, but we as healthcare providers are strongly recommending them, obviously, for the people at the moment in the 1B groups. Thanks, Margie. So um, that was in response to um, so Ina's last two questions. One was um, a lot of our elders may not want to get the vaccine because of age, chronic illness and mistrust of the government, historical. Um, what are the effects of the vaccine on people who have chronic illness? Can they wait uh, a little while longer, like a wait and see how goes first and are there penalties? So thanks, Margie, for um, clearly explaining um, the answer to that question. Um, anything, Mark or James, that you would add um, in an answer to that question? I just want to say that the clinical trials for AstraZeneca had about twenty percent of the population with chronic disease in uh, in the trials, and um, I was putting out the data that um, uh, in Canada around uh, two hundred and thirty five doses of the vaccine have been administered to First Nations peoples in six hundred and ten communities around the country. Uh, our sector has started uh, in the last week really rolling out the vaccines to our population. In the US, um, more than 400,000 American Indian and Alaskan natives have, uh, have uh, um, received uh, the dose of the vaccine. Um, it, it equates to around 20% of the total American Indian, Alaskan native population in, the, in America. But despite only 20%, um, uh, despite 20 percent being vaccinated, the last four weeks in America have been the most deadliest four weeks for American Indians and Alaskan natives for um, COVID, which is why this vaccine really needs to be rolled out rapidly in those countries, but also here. Um, as you can see from today, Brisbane's been locked down. We're going to be in this state for a very long time until... Um, an adequate level of protection is provided to the population um, through the vaccines. Um, and uh, let's put it bluntly, um, COVID's here forever. We're never going to be able to eliminate it. Um, we're at a state where it's at a global population level now. We'll never be able to eliminate it. And vaccine is one of the ways out of it, uh, along with uh, complementary and traditional medicine, as has been previously spoken. Thanks, James. Mark? Um, no, look, not, not much to add other than um, from a clinical perspective, they're, they're absolutely, absolutely our kind of one of our priority groups is, is people with chronic disease. They're the ones who are going to get the most complications and have more severe 
um, issues with um, COVID. So, um, um, so in that sense, that there's totally a, a risk benefit ratio that that works for benefits. Um, and as you're quite aware, like um, we have a high proportion of our older population that have chronic diseases, um, and they're the ones we're most um, targeting to try to ensure that they're safe uh, and are kept safe during this time. Um, so kind of that's part of our real rollout um, message is um, um, if you're older and you do have chronic diseases, this, this is really important to get. Um, and, um, and definitely from the, the, um, the data so far internationally, as James has, and, and others have said, um, the, um, the um, benefits fully outweigh the risks. And have a, if you have a good look at some of those places overseas, like Navajo communities um, in the four states over there, um, and they have been absolutely smashed. Um, and um, so I just think it's really important we get in early and, and ensure our elders are kept safe. Thanks, Mark. Um, and I'll hand over to Greg for Enid's um, other question. Um, Greg, could you talk about, um, and you may not know, um, but uh, whether not getting the vaccine may in future inhibit travel around the communities and other states? Thanks, Melissa. Um, we've always held, and this has sort of been agreed at the national and also the state, that um, the vaccine isn't mandatory. Um, I think we need to do our best in both, you know, um, look at vaccination levels, but also look at the other mechanisms that um, James and others have mentioned to um, combat um, COVID. I think also the, um, the shutdown, we were quite well managed to plan. So there was no outbreaks of COVID or incidences of COVID in the remote communities, um, basically. So we were very well with a lot of support from the mayors and local community. So I think um, at this point, there's nothing like that. And, you know, the vaccine is mandatory. I think it's about us um, as healthcare providers and friends and health in um, providing clear, open advice for people to make their own decisions um, around that. Thanks, Greg. Um, now, I'd love to hand over to Linda um, uh, to have a chat with um, John Anderson um, about the questions that he's asked. Linda? Oh, yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> Um, yeah, so John uh, at our last session did a deadly summary of um, all of the questions that were asked um, and the conversations that was happening in our last Q&A session. Um, so, and he's also put in a couple of um, comments and questions. I think um, if you can expand on the, you know, um, decision making locally, um, I think that that would be a really good um, statement that needs to be expanded on a little bit more. Um, around empowering communities to make um, decisions about the health services, health service delivery, um, especially around the traditional um, healing stuff. John, um, if you can expand on that, that would be awesome. Yeah, thank you, Linda. And look, thank you for the for the powerful messaging that we've we've, we've been seeing so far in in, in the chat and, and online. Um, look, just picking up, I, I suppose, on comments that made by by Enid and and um, also Simon and, and Dr. Alviana there around traditional healing, those spaces. So very much so, uh, people and place are, are, are bound to the cultural landscapes. So First Nations consumer confidence comes from our psyche, comes from our identity, having confidence in the in the greater system. Um, it, it, the importance of having, having um, First Nations workers engaging with communities. Yeah, we've got a, a, an area the size of of um, um, Scotland, UK, um, Central uh, and Southwest Queensland, where there is uh, the, the closest um, uh, Aboriginal and, and Torres Strait Islander Community Controlled Health Services are in Charleville and Mount Isa. So there's a big gap in there, and there, there in that space out there, there's there's only two to three First Nations health workers. So they're moving around a, a part of Queensland larger than that, pop, that the UK area there with 10% uh, with of, of, of that population as first, first Peoples. So First Nations consumer confidence in the system and that it is okay and the like also needs with that some, some 
conversations around the mental health of people. And we're seeing this happening at the moment with, with consultations happening with re, uh, regional and remote um, um, health and wellbeing strategy. Gathering information, but that's the, that process also needs some, some co-design with mob on the ground where this, this support for strong and powerful conversations doesn't quite reach there. We had Mount Isa mob in, in last time there. I'm not too sure if we, I'm glad we've got Sherberg here. I'm not too sure if Kanamala's joined us, but these conversations are important now uh, with, with people in place. Yeah, yeah. The power and energy of landscape and, and our traditional healing. Mm. But thank you, yeah. Thanks, John. Thanks, Linda. Um, and there was a comment in the chat from you, Barry. Um, it sounds like you recently had your vaccine. Um, I'd love if you were um, comfortable with sharing um, how you made your decision um, to get the vaccine and what the experience was like for you during and afterwards. Yeah, thanks, uh, Melissa. I had the vaccine on Thursday morning and uh, I received a text message from our AMS and it was just the same as getting a flu needle. Uh, they just asked you to sit around for 15 minutes, make sure you had no reactions and then I went home. So uh, I have to wait till July for the second dose and then have to wait, then they can get the flu needle after that. So it's a bit of a wait, that's all. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I think you might be the first consumer that I've spoken to who's received it. So yeah, that's really wonderful news. <laughs> Has anybody else received the vaccine and like to share their experience of deciding to get it and what it was like to get it, how you felt? No, not many people have so far. Melissa, I've received the vaccine. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can share my experience. I was, um, a, you know, feeling a little bit apprehensive, like most people, I don't love needles, but it was actually an incredibly positive experience. I had a sore arm after the first dose, um, but really nothing else. It only lasted for a day. After the second dose, I had a few more systemic symptoms. I had a, quite a bad headache for, for a couple of hours and I felt a bit achy. It only lasted one to two days um, and then I felt absolutely fine and I really took that as a sign that my immune system had been stimulated and it kicked in and you know I clearly had the vaccine so um, yeah I, I, overall I'd say totally expected in terms of the side effects and um, now I feel really good. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks, Margie. And how did you feel? I mean, you know, this is your area of research. You've watched the pandemic unfold um, over the last 12 months. How did you feel emotionally getting... I actually it? felt just so incredibly grateful and I, I felt excited. I, of course, asked someone to take a photo of me getting the vaccine. I shared it widely. I shared it with my family and friends. My children were excited for me, my four kids. They were saying, when can we get it, mum? I just think, you know, it's really important for everyone to understand what a momentous achievement it is for us to have these vaccines really within a year of the onset of this pandemic. And they are part of our passport, our ticket out of this. Um, and none of the safety phases in the vaccine development have been skipped. All the same three phases of vaccine development have been um, undertaken for all the vaccines in the clinical trials. They've just been able to go a bit quicker because of the huge investment of money um, globally, the vaccine platforms that have been available and sort of been able to quicken up a lot of the regulatory processes. So, I think I'd just like to really reassure people that although we have got these vaccines quickly, no corners have been cut um, and that they are safe. And honestly, I was incredibly excited to receive it. Thanks, Margie. And um, Mark, I'd love your perspective, um, uh, especially as you're seeing the vaccine roll out across the Cape, you know, your communities. How does that feel for you to see this happening, you know, within 12 months of the start of this pandemic? And what do you hope to see happen over the next couple of months? Oh, sorry, just a minute. 
uh, let me see. Uh, you can hear me now. Yep. Um, um, yeah. Look, um, I, I think um, once again, look. Even initially, I was surprised by the speed that we developed this vaccine, and that worried me a little bit. And so I, I really had to look into this clinically, um, right down to cellular level, to kind of reassure, reassure myself that everything was done the right way, um, and um, and it was. And um, I'm, I'm pretty reassured about that, and which, which is a good thing because I think, you know, lots of people say, oh, wow, it's just too fast. How, how can this be effective if it's so fast? And, um, uh, and I thought the same thing at first, but um, the, the, um, the good news is that it's been done properly and it's good technology and it's good, good medicine. Um, and um, what we've seen so far um, up our way is this has been, been pretty, um, pretty, pretty, community's been very open and um, oh, actually happy to talk about it and talk about their, their um, um, uh, how they feel it, it should be done and stuff like that. And um, so we've done a few um, videos that are out there at the moment um, on social media around our community members talking about how they feel about the, the rollout and the vaccine, et cetera. And, and that's been really fantastic. And, and basically people have, have had good questions, really smart questions and um, that we've had to really think through and make sure we give you know good transparent answers to um so no trying to hide behind scientific jargon and stuff like that um this is the area this one is so important for us to just to get a plain clear message um out and be very transparent about any side effects and anything else that happens so um um so that's what we've been trying to do um and of course there will be side effects etc um and there will be um, occasional people like has happened to have anaphylactic reactions the same as they do with any of the injections or any medication that's in, you know at all to be honest um so um so those things are still there um and it's once again just um giving people the information that they want to know about and then them making um their informed decisions about whether or not to get the vaccine and 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 most are look you know and our communities are pretty vaccine savvy as well um and have always had fairly high rates of vaccinations etc so one um, people are fairly across things um and that's kind of where it's up to and, and once again on the the travel stuff um um you know as most people are aware our remote communities um closed themselves off at the start of the vaccine rollout and um before the biosecurity act was even enacted in some um, of the remote communities in Cape York, and they did that as a community. Um, but I don't. I think um, um, once the vaccine starts rolling out, I, I don't think there'll be any big issues there, and I think everyone will feel a lot safer. That's great. Thanks, Mark. And James, your reflections, the feelings, what you've been feeling as you see it finally rolling out across First Nations communities. Uh, as I said before, I think, uh, yeah, it's one of our answers out of this. And um, it, uh, I do have some uh, issues, I think, with uh, vaccine hesitancy. The anti-vaxxer groups have been very strong in recruiting Aboriginal people uh, um, and putting up on social media lots of uh, uh, videos about the vaccines. I think we just need to remember about the science in all of this to make sure that our people are very well informed that... Uh, they get, they seek information from the right sources. They uh, check their facts when they're getting it off social media, particularly. Um, I think the, the rollout in the Taurus has been um, very heartening to see that you can, that it is achievable and that we can do this uh, pretty well. Um, I think uh, trusting the Aboriginal Medical Services and other staff that are in our health services in our communities um, will be paramount as we move forward. So I think uh, overwhelmingly, um, um, I think the mood is changing and people recognise that vaccines are, uh, the more and more doses are administered around the world, the safer they are and the adverse outcomes are being noted around the world. And they're generally the, the sore arm and the headache and no um, major issues. There's been some adverse reporting about clotting, but um, all the regulatory bodies in the Europe and uh, at the England and, uh, and Australia put out very big statements about uh, those reports. So I think um, we've got some challenges ahead, but we've just got to keep on working at it to make sure we get uh, very good coverage across our communities. Thanks, James. Um, now, um, I'd love to throw to the Kawanyama, Kawanyama Justice Group. Um, are you able to jump online up there and ask your question about the flu vaccine? If not, I'm happy to ask it. Hello. Hello there. Hello, welcome. 
Yeah, I just um, wanted to know about the, I missed the first part of your um, link up because I was mucking around getting linking on. Um, how far apart the, should you have the doses? And do you need, do you need uh, top ups like the flu vaccine? Mm -hmm. And you were also asking, um, do you still get the flu? Yeah, the flu, yeah. Yeah, and I guess what what's the gap between the COVID vaccines and the flu? So yes. who out of our panel members is the best place to answer that question? Happy to, to answer that. It's a great question. I think it's important for everyone to realise that the recommendations of the gaps between the doses differ a little bit depending on which brand of the COVID vaccine you're getting. Now, people receiving the AstraZeneca vaccine do need to wait 12 weeks between dose one and dose two. And that's because in the clinical trials that um, the, the efficacy was highest. It was about 84% against um, uh, symptomatic disease. Uh, so it's really important that we have that gap. But Barry, just to clear up a little bit of the confusion too about a flu vaccine, the flu vaccine this year is going to be really important. We are seeing a huge rebound in viruses this year nationally. Things like RSV, you know, certainly for me, a lot of kids are very sick. I don't know what that is, sorry, at the hospital. So we're actually really anticipating a big flu year with lots of flu disease. Last year was super quiet, as we know, all those social distancing measures, the viruses all went to sleep and went away. Uh, and that was great. The hospitals were quiet. It was sort of eerie, despite what was going on with the pandemic. This year, we've seen an explosion in viruses and it's really quite concerning. So we are really worried about a big flu year. The, the gap between the COVID vaccine and the flu vaccine is really to try and separate out if people have any side effects or adverse events, um, things like fever or, or anything else. So, but Barry, I think as long as there's a two week gap between your COVID vaccine and your flu vaccine, we really wouldn't want you waiting three or four months to get your flu vaccine because that puts you at risk of flu. So, but please talk about it with your doctor. There might be something else we're not aware of and your doctor knows you best. But at the moment, you should be able to get your flu vaccine as long as it's not within two weeks of your COVID vaccine. Thanks, Margie. Um, I had also heard someone say that they wondered if the flu season would be smaller this year because we don't have international flights coming in and bringing flu from overseas but no that's that's not a protection no, I don't think so I think I mean certainly in the hospitals already we're starting to see flu go up um, which is very strange for February March mm -hmm. um, the flu vaccines are not quite here yet but they're not well oh, we've just lost you I think Margie is that just my connection or everybody with chronic disease oh there we go sorry Mikey do you mind just repeating that answer we just lost you oh sorry I think it's the internet's a bit unstable I was saying it's going to be really important for people to get the flu vaccine this year because we are seeing flu go up already in the hospitals earlier than we expect February March um, and especially again those people with underlying chronic diseases are at higher risk of flu as are children, of course, under the age of five. Um, so really want to encourage everyone to get that message out there this year that flu is, getting the flu vaccine is very important. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks, Margie. Sorry, I'm just catching up on questions. Um, so is there anybody who could talk about the common side effects um, from the AstraZeneca vaccine? Is anybody up to date on those from our panel and what people might expect? Greg? Yeah, I'm happy to take that one um, initially. Um, now, the AstraZeneca people have um, about approximately two thirds have acknowledged some sort of symptoms. Um, this ranges from sore arm to basically feeling a little bit flu like, run down, some headaches. Um, our public health medical officer, her husband got vaccinated the other day and sort of felt quite run down that night. Um, so it is, um, as Margie said, it is sort of in part your sort of immune system kicking in, um, but it is also something that we are working with Ausvax to try and get data on First Nations people and add 
um, adverse events following immunisation. So we can look to um, see if there is any differentials. We're not expecting any, but it's important to keep um, on track of these things. And also it's important that um, our messaging from Queensland Health and Commonwealth is um, these symptoms are, you know, you can expect some symptoms. We have to be honest about this. And we also have to promote people to record these events. So if there are um, other events or there's patterns that, you know, the TGA and others can sort of monitor and put things into place if need be. Thanks, Greg. I'm going to take over from Melissa while she goes off to that meeting. Thank you so much, Melissa, for facilitating Thanks, so Sarah. beautifully. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you so much to our panellists. Um, Greg, you just talked about Ausbax, and I thought it might be a great opportunity to ask about the safety nets that um, the system's put in place to hear very quickly about um, side effects from the vaccines. Is someone, are you the best place to talk about that, Greg, or other people on the panel? It might be other people on the panel a bit more clinical than my mind. I can talk about that. Great, go for it, Margie, thanks. I'm happy to talk about Ausvac safety. So that's the other really important thing for everyone to know is that um, almost the most important phase of the development of these vaccines uh, is the monitoring phase after the vaccines are introduced into the population. We call that phase four. And in Australia, we're really lucky. We have such a robust vaccine safety monitoring system. And that's done in two ways through the TGA, and through um, the National Centre for Immunisation Research and Surveillance through a system called Ausvac Safety. And what that means is um, there is um, technology for people after they've received their vaccine in primary care, they get a text message three days after they've had the vaccine and eight days after they've had the first dose of vaccine, and then 42 days after the second dose of vaccine, asking them to fill out if they had any side effects. So, that way we're able to monitor in real time all of these side effects that we're talking about. And then we're able to compare whether we're seeing an increase in side effects over what was seen in the clinical trials. And so that constant ongoing monitoring of safety is absolutely essential because if we suddenly, for example, started seeing um, more fever or um, other adverse events that we were to be concerned about, then that would trigger, trigger a whole um, vaccine safety investigation similar to what we've seen going on globally with the blood clots, uh, which we may talk about a bit later. Um, so we are very lucky in Australia. We actually have probably one of the most robust and strongest vaccine um, safety surveillance systems in the world. Great. Thanks, Margie. James and Mark, do you want to add to that at all? You're on mute, Mark. I didn't, you didn't hear me swear then. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't hear that. Yeah, no button. yeah um, look, um, yeah, look, same. The, the, those um, that are side, side effects that um, have just been described are the ones that we expect. Um, and um, that, that's kind of, yeah, look, it, it, the, um, um, there's a lot of misinformation about those kinds of things that are out there. And I think it's, once again, just important to go really good um, authority kind of um, websites and, um, to look for the symptomatology and stuff like that, rather than just following social media around those things. And um, um, and almost all of those have been described, um, and they are normal. Um, and that's that is that's your body reacting and starting to make antibodies and all that kind of stuff to fight off the um, the virus the next time. And the, the timing's been really um, interesting in the trials, you know, around those twelve weeks versus whatever, you know, um, and things like that. But they're actually specific time frames. Um, that allow your body to give the most effective response to those vaccines so that, that, that it's much more effective than if you just had two doses at the same time kind of thing. So um, that's the reason for that. And, um, and they are. And, and the more that people can report any side effects, um, you know, documented, then, then the more information we'll have. So that's useful. Jo, can I just add one more thing about safety? Aside from the text messages or the active surveillance, as Mark was referring to, in most states in Australia, people can actually report in adverse events. In um, Victoria, we have um, a system called SafeVic. There are different um, clinics in every state where people can actually ring up and report adverse events or discuss their 
adverse event in a clinic, which is being set up with doctors. And then the third thing to know about is we're also really fortunate now because these COVID vaccines are going to be recorded on the air, they are going to be able to be linked to hospital data sets as well. So they'll be able to be for us to look at whether or not some of the rarer um, adverse events that we may be worried about of, of people being admitted to hospital with things like vaccine enhanced disease or some other things that we may be concerned about, that will be tracked as well in terms of hospital admissions and the vaccines being received. So you've kind of got the passive surveillance, the active surveillance, and then the hospital surveillance. So there's three tiers to the vaccine safety. So it is amazing. Thanks, Marky. And are you able to describe, you've talked about AIR. Can you let yeah. people know what AIR stands for? Oh, sorry. So the AIR is the Australian Immunisation Register, which um, used to be called ACER or the Childhood Immunisation Register, but in 2016 became a whole of life register. And what's really exciting is that these COVID vaccines, um, providers who have done the training and are able to give the COVID vaccines, it's mandatory for them to upload that dose. So is it dose one or two and the brand into the air? And so, you know, for Indigenous Australians, um, we'll be able to know, you know, whether who, what dose they received, what brand they received, and also know, um, you know, unfortunately, we don't know the chronic medical conditions. They're not recorded on air, but they are recorded in the um, GP uh, practices and in the medical registers. And we're working very hard to have the recognition of chronic medical conditions on air, but that hasn't um, happened quite yet. Great. Thanks, Margie. And um, is there anyone that knows, Margie was talking about those clinics that Victoria has got. Does Queensland have similar um, clinics where people can report adverse events at all? James, Mark or Greg? Looks like Greg's going to, he's leaning forward. Yeah, um, I'm fairly sure we do. We might just have to send out a session. I did note that um, we did have some poor cases of anaphylaxis. Um, people who were allergic to, um, had allergic to other allergies. Um, so about a fortnight ago and following that, we have had an increase in reporting of adverse events. Um, they all do flow down centrally, but I'm pretty sure um, we'll send you something that Queensland Health does record those as well. Great, thanks, Greg. If there's nothing else, I'll throw to Linda to ask the next question. Thanks, Joe. So just from that, I think I'm hearing that, you know, um, this is all kind of, it, it's, we're kind of going with the flow and really collecting the data as we go and the importance of um, reporting these adverse effects um, throughout the rollout. Um, the next question that we're looking at is from um, Simon and Aldiana um, about the trials on vaccines done specifically on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, so I did see an answer to this earlier up um, from Professor James Ward about um, this happening internationally, um, First Nations people being part of the, um, the trials, but what about um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? So were there any Ab Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as part of the um, vaccine trials, um, panel members? Uh, no, not as far as I'm aware. These uh, trials were conducted overseas, obviously where the, where the drugs, uh, where the vaccines are being manufactured. And um, as such, no Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were part of the clinical trials. Um, indigenous populations in Brazil, the United States, um, and um, a few other countries were included in the clinical trials, but um, uh, no Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people. Um, very soon after Easter, the Commonwealth have promised that the, um, an update on data that's publicly available, will be publicly available from the AIR, the Australian Immunisation Register on Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people who've already taken up the vaccine. And we also know from the um, uh, VAC safety website, the VAC safe uh, website, um, is that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are completing their surveys um, at an equivalent rate to non-Aboriginal populations and reporting very similar, there's no difference in side effects between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and non-Aboriginal people um, who are completing the surveys post-vaccine, post their shots. So um, it's, um, I don't think there's any um, 
uh, as were in the clinical trials, there was no differences between uh, Indigenous populations and the uh, non-Indigenous populations. And remember also, I put in a whole lot of data in there about where the vaccines have already been um, administered among First Nations peoples in, in Canada and uh, in the United States with over, uh, between those two countries alone, over 600,000 cases, uh, 600,000 doses have been administered to First Nations peoples in those two countries there. So, um, and New Zealand is just starting their vaccine programs. They're still at um, the very early phase. They're um, um, uh, still at the border, um, frontline border people and uh, frontline healthcare workers. They're still in that phase. Um, move on to uh, Maori population as, they, as we have with as a second tier priority population. Thank you for expanding on that. Thank um, you for that, James. Um, I just want to add that as, as far as I'm concerned as a public health, there should have been trials undertaken before the rollout in all, all these communities. I have, I have an issue as a public health doctor in regards to the way the vaccine has been rolled out in the communities. No trials on the adults population, no trials on the elders. And is, is this the same gonna happen with the children? I'm really concerned about that. Yeah, I mean, Mark might be able to uh, comment after me, but I'll, I'll say that um, in the elderly, the vaccine trials were um, trialled in the elderly and, um, and they've been, you know, remember now that half a billion people in the world have had the vaccines. Uh, and in most countries, they've started with the elderly and there have been no um, uh, mortality associated with the vaccine. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, attributable to the vaccine. And so I think that's really important to take hold of where the, the benefits really outweigh the risks uh, for our populations here. And it's proving more and more each day as we, um, as more and more people around the world get vaccinated, that the vaccines are safe and effective and doing what they're meant to be doing. Um, yeah, look, I have nothing much more to add to that um, other than um, initially, of course, we, we actually did want to wait to see what happened overseas to the mother mob um, before we started messing around with our own mob. And, um, and uh, oh, sorry. sorry. Um, but, um, uh, and I agree in a, in a, um, in a, in a time uh, with, with none of the time and resource constraints, um, it would have been good to have um, cohorts of Indigenous people in Australia um, in those trials. Um, but uh, look, you know, it didn't happen. Um, there wasn't a lot of time and there wasn't a lot of lead time um, around this. We were kind of more interested in what was happening overseas to see whether we, sh you know, whether there going to be big side effects or not in the big trials, um, in which case we wouldn't have been involved. But um, um, so, yeah, I guess at the moment what we're, what we're looking at is just the side effect profiles of people that do get it. And um, uh, the other thing is that it's, it's, it actually is fairly, it, it would be um, the, the variation across Australia for our mob is very high. Um, and that includes genetically. Genetically, we, we are as, have got as much genetic variation from East Coast to West Coast of Australia in indigenous populations as the whole of Europe and Asia. Um, so we would have been, it, we would have had to sample very, very um, generally um, across a whole lot of areas. Um, and um, yeah, we didn't have time to do that. Well, that was my understanding anyway. Um, and uh, it would have been fantastic to be able to do that. Um, uh, but yeah, currently no. Okay, thanks James and Mark for that. And thank you for the question, Alviana. Um, you know, it's definitely one that needs to be asked because we do know that a lot of our community members um, are really, um, you know, feel like we, we would be like guinea pigs, like our elders would be. You know, I've heard that in community a lot, so it is good to have that cleared up and actually understand, you know, um, who was involved in the trials. Um, jo, can you um, ask our next question, please? Sure thing, but I'll go to Margie next because I think that Margie wanted to respond as well to that last one. Margie? Oh, sorry, Margie. <laughs> no, that's okay. Thanks, Linda. Um, Dr. Elviana, it was a really excellent question. I'd also want to say, and unfortunately, in Indigenous Australians, there have only been 150 cases and no deaths. So, in fact, 
even if we had been able to run clinical trials here in Australia, not only amongst Indigenous Australians, but other ethnic minority groups. Um, for Indigenous Australians, we would not be able to get any data really that would be meaningful around clinical effectiveness because fortunately the cases have been so low. So in fact, the most important thing now is for us to do exactly what we're doing and that's monitor the safety that James outlined as the vaccines go into the community and look very carefully for any signal. Um, and of course we could measure antibodies at the immune response, um, but in terms of unfortunately understanding the impact on disease, that the cases are so low um, that many of these trials could not be run in Australia. And that's a good thing really, but that's why mostly they were done overseas because we have so we had relatively so little disease here compared to the US, the UK, Europe. Thanks, Margie. Um, um, thank you. Now, in regards to the children, the reason I am asking this question is I'm a mother of nine kids. Uh, they range from the age of 34 to 12. And I'd like to know if trials are gonna be undertaken before I'm expected to take my children to have these vaccines. I can answer that. Um, so yes, they have um, uh, the trials, the Pfizer vaccine trials in children um, started in October last year in 12 to 15 year olds. And there's now a trial occurring in 300 five to 11 year olds. And for the AstraZeneca vaccine that started in February for six to 17 year olds. And we're told we'll have that data by October, November. So I cannot see vaccines, they will not be rolled out for children until we have clinical trial data on the efficacy and the safety. Um, fortunately, we all know children get less sick from COVID, um, which is why they have been prioritized so far down the line in terms of clinical trials. The focus has been on the adults and the elderly and those with chronic conditions. So we don't have trial data yet, but as early as October is when we should have it. But children are going to be critical if we're going to reach that herd immunity threshold that we want to get up to across Australia, which we think is around 70, 80 percent of the population having had a vaccine. We are most likely going to have to include children in that. So that will happen. But I think we all are waiting very um, patiently for the clinical trial data in children. Thank you, Margie. And thank you, Elviana, for your question. Thank you. Thank you all for your answering my questions and my queries. Thank you. Um, now we've got 14 minutes to go. So if anyone's got burning questions that they haven't asked yet, please feel free to um, unmute yourself and jump on now. Um, and if there aren't, I'd like to ask Neville, you've put a comment up on chat and it's not really a question, but I thought it's an interesting comment. Would you be happy to um, pop yourself off mute and make that comment to everyone? My name's Keisha. It's just my novel. It's never oh, died. Sorry about that, Keisha. So, yeah, I work out in uh, Central West, out in, um, well, Central West Hospital and Health Service, but I'm out in Booyah at the moment as well. But how are we supposed to promote, like, as health workers, it's our job to promote, like, staff, like, all health-based information. Now, if this, has, this vaccine hasn't been tested on... Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, how am I supposed to provide a proof for them if they're asking me? Because they're not going to want to have it if there's no proof. It's hard enough to get people to get a flu shot. Thanks. Good question, Keisha. And I'll ask each of the panel members. James, you just indicated you want to go first. Yeah, I'll go first. I'll say, um, so as the um, data starts rolling in, uh, in Australia, Keisha, I think it is, um, uh, we can feel more confident that the vaccine is going to be effective against our population. The thing about the vaccine is it reduces the severity of disease if somebody catches COVID, if somebody acquires COVID. So, um, and if we know in our population there are high risk of uh, high burden of chronic disease, and those people have poorer outcomes. So the vaccine is really to try and reduce the um, severity of disease in the population. And I think overwhelmingly the world is showing uh, that is having a big impact. We don't know in the longer term yet whether it will reduce uh, transmission in the population, but it's looking promising that that will happen in the longer term. The other thing I would say is that um, for communities all across this country, so right now we've got our borders closed to the rest of the world. And 
as soon as we open up our borders, which is likely to happen um, probably towards the end of this year, we will have COVID come in uh, left, right and centre into Australia. We won't be able to keep our borders closed forever. We'll have COVID come in as um, uh, uh, much more frequently than it does now and there'll be hardly any quarantine. It might not be quarantine uh, as there is now because it's an expensive exercise but a necessary exercise. Um, so the issue will be, do we, keep our board, do we keep the borders closed for our communities in the longer term to protect them? I don't think anyone wants to be closed down like we were during the first phase of the pandemic. And so I think the question we need to think about is um, uh, the, making sure that we get as many of our population vaccinated so when they do travel, and our mob like to travel, as you know, um, that they'll be protected um, as much as possible from vaccine wherever they go to. So I think at the moment there's a lot of hesitation about travel and travelling between jurisdictions because you might get blocked down in between jurisdictions, between states and territories. I think the longer term, I think we just need to really sell this as a, um, there's, no, there's no risks to the population aside from the very few common side effects. The benefits way, far outweigh the risks. We cannot keep our communities locked down and all these border uh, restrictions in place for the longer term and we can't keep our international borders closed. So I think we're gonna be at risk in the longer term those people that choose not to have the vaccine, they're gonna be at huge risk of severe disease from uh, COVID if they don't choose to have the vaccine. Yeah, I, I know you and me understand that, but sometimes community don't. And, you know, like, I suppose all we gotta do is try, which is what yeah. you're saying, but it's gonna be a hard one for us, especially health workers. Thanks, Keisha. And do you feel like you've got the um, like the comms materials that you can um, show when you're having these conversations with community members that might help um, build their understanding as well? Yeah, we have that stuff, but also people got to understand I'm the only health worker here in the Central West and there's a pretty big area. Yeah, it's a massive area, Keisha. Yeah. The biggest in Queensland, isn't it? The Central West Hospital and Health Service area. One uh, northwest is pretty, I think, a bit bigger than us. But I'm the only health worker, and there's a chronic disease coordinator and a indigenous health coordinator, and we've only just got an executive director, and it's a huge area. And you know, especially out here where I am at in Buya, we probably had the largest population of the indigenous people within the Central West. So, do you know what I mean? Like, it's a big job. They've already started in in the Eastern Corridor or where, like out here and stuff. But yeah, I don't, I don't know, it'll take a while. It takes long enough for flu vax and a lot of people don't like getting that. And then you're bringing it, I know COVID's a different story and stuff like that, but they need a lot more education than a couple of these little sessions too, because they don't understand. Yep. Thanks so much, Keisha. Really appreciate that feedback. Linda, um, I'll throw to you. Yeah, no, that was a really deadly question, Tisha, because, you know, this is the whole reason why we're running these sessions and doing this project is to ensure that, you know, these health services understand where our community is coming from and so they're actually able to develop the communications materials that are needed so that our mob can make informed decisions about their healthcare and about the vaccinations. Um, so, you know, this project is all about that. We want to hear from community. We want to hear... We want to hear what communications do you need so that you can make an informed decision? Um, so yeah, um, really, really keen to maybe go offline and have a yarn about that further, about how we can do that better for your region. Um, I think that kind of brings us to an end now. We might just wrap up um, with each of the pan panel members and ask you to just, um, if you have any comments that you want to, um, closing comments that you want to make before we throw it to our consumer rep, John, to close. So Greg, we, Greg, we might start with you and we'll go Greg, Margie, James, then Mark. Is that all right? Yeah, probably the um, least esteemed person to kick off. Um, I think, um, as James sort of indicated, um, eventually we will open our borders a lot more, particularly to international um, 
I think the Torres Strait is just an example of where we're trying to use vaccination as well as, you know, the border and the constant messaging to, um, you know, protect people from, you know, COVID outbreaks. But I think um, it is important to also reflect that people will, will be on this journey in different aspects. And I think for all consumers and health representatives, we just need to make time to talk to people and sort of talk them through the evidence and experience. And um, it's not like, you know, the vaccine truck will be in, you know, bull you one day and then it will never be back. I think this is a bit of a rolling thing. We'll be picking people up along the journey as we go. So I think we have to respect people's decisions. And um, I think I was on a chat with health workers and it was all very quiet until we um, there was a question of, has someone been vaccinated? And then people started telling their own experiences. So I think that will be a critical point too when we start people to tell their stories of their vaccination and their experience. Um, but we have to be aware that um, while Australia has done very well, um, we can't be in lockdown forever. The biosecurity on the remote communities had, um, had side in, had side effects on the communities themselves, their freedom, things like that, which we don't really want to go back to. So, um, so I think we just have to sort of walk this line and use vaccination as one of the tools. Thanks. Thanks, Greg. I've just actually noticed the time and can I just interrupt the rest of the panel members and throw to John Anderson just to make sure that if we run short of time, um, it's not John that loses a bit of time. John, are you able to unmute yourself and give a bit of a reflection from the consumer perspective about the, um, the questions you heard today? Yeah, thank you, Joe. And uh, look, Thank you, thank you, panelists and and consumers from right across this this, this great big great big deadly country. Uh, I pay my respects um, from, from my part uh, from mob in North Queensland, um, Mummel people, the Wagi people, and also uh, home home island Bookerman, uh, but also Bidjara, Katakata, and Garingbul in that central western area out right, that way. Um, uh, the first lesson that 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 I heard this morning was uh, was was from Melissa, um, in in highlighting how uh, Health Consumers Queensland uh, has has had to pivot and rebalance as an organisation swiftly with 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 so many challenges um, uh, being experienced by its members and the like, and even even today with lockdown in Brisbane, um, requiring pivoting pivoting and rebalancing. 1B um, with regards to vaccinations be the next one's rolling out. Um, that encouragement that I heard from panelists about first peoples to, to ensure they get the vaccination rather than wait. Um, but from first, from, from my, my experience here as a, as a consumer at a 20, 24 seven uh, general health, health practice, I've been told to wait um, as, as a as a 62 year old First Nations consumer, because there are other sections of the community in front of me. I'm sure I would get my vaccination quicker if I went to an Aboriginal community controlled health organization, but the system is still managed and, and driven by the, by the majority. Powerful messages. Um, James, thank you for your pass, pa uh, powerful messages about uh, about the dire circumstances of, of, of First Peoples in, in the US and Canada experiences. Um, part of the, the, the privilege that we've had with communities going into lockdown and having, having communities in regional and remote settings, it, it's uh, as expressed in the, in the last setting, it, it's an, one of the few amazing privileges to be part of a minority group when we represent 0.5% of, of the known cases across, uh, across Australia. Um, a reminder also is, is, is the system uh, practitioners, we don't have it all covered um, because the gap identified there in whatever shape and form we might, become, might come to understand between the traditional healing and the traditional healer interface with the big system. Those people that are able to walk across boundaries and navigate across boundaries. Yeah? 
National data might show that First Nations people, as I said before, might represent uh, half percent of COVID cases nationally, but maybe the Queensland COVID dashboard might be able to present small area First Nations data, such as cases and rate of vax per population. So we can understand and see and respond quickly if there's a change in this with having um, people being vaccinated and people that move within, with, within those community boundaries potentially transmit, transmitting. We need to, that first, um, that small area statistics, small area data also helps with building First Nations consumer confidence. AIR, um, look, um, Dr. Mark might, might uh, appreciate this one. Thunderclap Newman in 1969, uh, wrote the song, Something in the Air. So for First Nations people, air uh, in, a, in a sense, we know that it was formerly known as ASA, um, the language of, 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 of COVID brought changes needs to be practical and understood by First Nations consumers. The language of, of our, our mob. Uh, again, Dr. James, uh, the Australian vaccine trials for First Nation peoples. Um, it'd be nice to understand whether those vaccine trials were conducted in purely in urban settings or did it include members of rural and remote communities? Dr. Mark Wenatong just reminding us, thank you, Mark. Us First Nations mob, we're ge genetically diverse coast to coast. Um, but the way that, that, that this pandemic is, has come, um, it's, it's forced us and our interests to be homogenized. Um, again, gen generically vaccinating First Nations people who are genetically diverse. Um, the small area data might help us understand if there are adverse um, challenges. Kaisha, um, uh, again, heart goes out to you, Kaisha, uh, being that 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 one worker out there in in that huge distance, ten hours from Mount Isa to Birdsville, and you servicing ten percent of the population out there who who are First Nations people. The, the challenge will be that, that um, for you, Keisha, and, and others is how responsive is the system for adverse reactions going to be in regional remote settings? And principally, our major responder out there is the RFDS, and they have limited capacity. So, um, again, an, an, another wonderful conversation um, brought together uh, Health Consumers Queensland. I thank the panelists for their wisdom um, and equally so with our health consumers from all of our different walks of life and lived experiences. Um, you're a blessing for being a part of this and, and taking away and sharing with, with what you've heard, what you know, and being advocates for, 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 for community and process. Many blessings, thank you. Thank you, John. Deadly summary as always. Um, can we please just get a very brief closing um, from our panellists, um, Margie, James and Mark. Thanks, Linda, and thanks, John. That was really excellent. My closing remarks are really around, I suppose, for Keisha, around perhaps trying to mobilise vaccine champions and advocates within your community, which I know you know, but you can't do it all on your own. And so don't underestimate how important it is to have senior elders, faith, you know, traditional faith um, healers. Those people need to be there having the vaccine for everyone to see. It sends a very powerful message that this is the norm. This is the right thing to do. We have faith in this vaccine. Um, and I think that might help you a little bit. It is incredibly challenging, I understand. But I think vaccine champions uh, are just absolutely critical. Um, and just also to remember that actually facts alone don't necessarily get people over the line. This is about trust and this is about community and it's about talking and engagement. So, and don't underestimate the power of a recommendation from a healthcare provider because we know that is the most important thing that actually may get someone to accept a vaccine. So best of luck and uh, yeah, it's it's been a pleasure to be involved today. So thank you to everyone. Thank you, Margie. Um, James, can you please go next with some closing remarks? 
I know it's been great uh, to be part of the panel. I um, I, um, I definitely uh, feel for uh, healthcare workers who are out there on their own in remote areas. Um, one thing that did really work well in the Taurus is having a community meeting before the rollout of the vaccine. Um, people could openly discuss, make sure you have the right people there um, who can answer all the questions that community members uh, have. One thing that Mark said early in the piece was that our um, people are much more educated about this disease than, uh, than we might anticipate and uh, people um, are interested in it and they want to know about this vaccine. So uh, we need to kind of think about how you can have um, uh, maybe rolling out a community meeting prior to the vaccine arriving in your communities. And the other thing I would say about people who are uh, not that keen to get vaccine if they're living in intergenerational households and uh, they encourage their whole, whole household not to have the vaccine, if the vaccine arrives in those communities, that, that household, that population is going to be very susceptible uh, to COVID if they don't have it. Uh, and Del Moreno, I think you asked a question about the variants. Um, the AstraZeneca vaccine um, is very effective against both the UK variant and the South Australian, uh, South, Australian South African var variant. Um, nine times fault, nine times lower for uh, the British uh, variant um, in virus neutralisation, and two times to thirty times lower uh, virus neutralisation for the South African strain. So really, um, really great that we have um, good candidates here in Australia to both uh, protect against those variants. So the uh, variants of concern actually at the moment. Uh, and thanks for being uh, for allowing me to be part of the panel and. Uh, uh, we'll always be here if, uh, as we go on with the um, rollout of the vaccine as we move forward. Thank you, James. Mark, would, do you have any closing comments? Um, look, yeah, just thanks once again and um, hope we help to answer some questions um, and also to show you that there are some unknowns um, um, and that we, we often live with uncertainty and particularly in medicine and, and in health. Um, but there are lots of knowns and there's lots of um, evidence around this, around um, uh, benefits outlying risks and for you know a health worker that's trying to do this in a massive place like that I mean we've been using up in Cape um, um, and in Cairns um, community you know local older really experienced health workers who want to come in and, and get the shot and then say it on video what it was like and stuff like that so and, and these ones are well respected long-term old health workers that have been around the communities for a long time and um, as well as some of the other people on councils and stuff like that and but that takes resources and time and um, and so some of the bigger community control services have that um, for you um, for, for lots of health workers they're working in isolation and they first have to you know you have to convince yourself that you're happy with the vaccination before you can actually really you know sell it to other people as well so I think it's really important if if you can get what information that you can to make sure that you're happy, um, because what, what will sell it is, yeah, is their relationship of trust with you. Um, that's usually what happens in our communities, as you know. So that's all I had. Thanks very much. Thank you, everyone. I would like to, um, we've run out of over time, so my apologies for that, but I thought that it was really important to hear from John and also to hear get closing remarks from all the panel members. I would like to give huge thanks and big shout out to all of our panel members, Professor James Ward, Associate Professor Margie Danchen and Dr. Mark Wenatong, along with Greg Richards, Richards, Richardson filling in at the last minute. Sorry, Greg, I've, I've fluffed your name. Three key things I just want to say very quickly. Um, there's lots of questions. We haven't been able to answer all of those questions. One Three Health has um, staff on um, there. If you let them know you're an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person and you'd like to speak to an Aboriginal Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander nurse, they've got nurses there on the One Three Health number. That's 13432584. You, so you can phone up and ask them your COVID questions. We will publish this video online and share it within the next 48 hours. And we'll let you, um, we'll share that link with you for you to share on with family and friends if you think they'd find it useful. And please take a couple of minutes if you can. We've been putting in the chat a quick feedback survey that will maybe take you 90 seconds to do. Uh, feedback is really important to us so that we can keep making these things better and better. Um, and thank you all for your time for joining us all across Queensland this morning and um, hope you travel safely today. Thank you for, um, on behalf of everyone at Health Consumers Queensland. Thanks, Linda. Bye everybody. Thank you Bye, for everybody. joining in today.